Hello, everybody. That was a very fun intro song that we had to play for our Midday Science Cafe this October that is animal themed. Lessons from the wild, how humans interact with and learn from other animals. And we just want to thank you for being here. Just a few things before we get started. You can uh, find closed captioning for this Midday Science Cafe in Zoom. Either it popped up automatically or it's in the three dots under more. Um, but feel free to open those up and follow us in text as well. Um, this is being recorded and we will post this uh, video to the uh, Science at Cal YouTube channel and the Berkeley Lab YouTube channel. So we will share it with you all at the end of once it's posted. We'll send you all an email and make sure you have that in your inbox for you to watch again or share with your friends. Um, and uh, I think that that's it. Oh, finally, we the at Midday Science Cafe, this is a very interactive experience. We ask you to ask a ton of questions of our scientists and our speakers. So you are going to add your Q&A either into the Q&A box or into the chat box. Either one, you don't have to use them both, but you're more than welcome um, to pick whichever one you're most comfortable with. And we will ask our scientists all of your questions. We'll have a very robust Q&A at the end um, of this program after they've given their talks. Um, so with that said, I'm going ahead and get our, our program started. Um, we like to start with the land acknowledgement. The Ber we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. I wanna thank you. We all wanna thank you for allowing us that time to make that acknowledgement. Our next midday science cafe is the road to excuse me road to vehicle electrification on November seventeenth. As you might know, our midday science cafes take place on the third Thursday of every month at noon from noon to 1.30. So please make sure you join us next month. We do take a holiday break for ourselves and for the scientists. We won't be having programming in, in December or January, but we'll start up again in February. So we hope to see you there. And if you're a part of our communities, you will be getting uh, lots of information uh, about our next series coming soon. All right. I am the executive director of Science at Cal. I don't think I've said that yet. Um, in 2008, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise public awareness and understanding and appreciation of scientific research at UC Berkeley. To realize this vision, Science at Cal engages the vast STEM that science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics community to service as communicators and to foster creative collaboration amongst the scientists and amongst community groups who share our commitment to equity and inclusion in STEM education and STEM careers. Science at Cal connects the Berkeley STEM researchers with uh, diverse community groups of all ages and backgrounds in all types of learning. We are at festivals, at science cafes, um, we're at Cal Day, we partner with folks like Berkeley Lab, consulates, libraries, we're at the First Farmers Markets, uh, or excuse me, fr Farmers Markets, First Fridays, community centers, inclusion, inclusiveness, creativity and innovation, all hallmarks of science at Cal Avenge, which reach tens of thousands of people annually. So thank you for being here as one of those. Throughout the year, Science at Cal presents these ongoing outreach programs in, other, in STEM and other disciplines to help promote groups' efforts, our research efforts, and we want to create new programs and partnerships across Berkeley within Ber UC Berkeley within the community. This broad scope of activities would not be possible without our dynamic 
network of campus alliances and valuable community partners, one of which, which being Berkeley Lab. I'm going to pause and thank Jen Tang for being here. She's going to come up next to talk about our partnership and Berkeley Lab. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dee. Uh, I am the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And for those who aren't familiar with Berkeley Lab, we are one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. And we're supported by the DOE's Office of Science and managed by the University of California. All of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. And since our founding way back in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we've been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Today, Berkeley Lab employees work together to develop meaningful scientific solutions to the world's most tractable energy and environmental challenges. We help train the next generation of scientists and engineers, and we ensure that those things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. Now, our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills, and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. Many of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as a student, postdoc, or professor, many of whom have joint appointments at the laboratory to do research. And we're fortunate to have an especially close relationship with UC Berkeley, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary scientific research from both of our institutions, and we hope you enjoy today's presentation. And on that note, it is actually my pleasure to invite our next speaker to the screen, Dr. Mark Klein. Mark is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Xtherma, whose got an ultimate vision to enable global organ sharing. Now, Mark has been continuously involved in research at the interplay of chemistry and biology, and he's an expert in supramolecular systems and peptidomimetic polymer synthesis, which you'll learn a little bit about shortly. Xtherma, which is based in Richmond, California, has developed a research program in the field of cryopreservation, which is focused on improving chemistry by using biomimetic strategies. As a materials postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Mark played a critical role for a DARPA project that made large strides in biomimetic nanoscience. And he also served as vice chair of the Berkeley Postdoctoral Entrepreneurial Program, where he guided UC Berkeley postdocs and graduate students to begin their entrepreneurial journey. Mark, as you might imagine, has been spending all of his waking hours over the last few years supporting Xtherma, so we're really lucky to have him here today with us. Mark, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you, Jen. Um, let me get my presentation up here for everybody. Okay, great. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm Mark. Um, Co-founded the company together with Xiao Xi Wei, uh, who's been working with me for more than ten years now in the field of chemistry. And uh, today, I want to talk about how we learn from nature in order to give organs more time. When we try to transplant organs, we actually need more time right now to go from the donor to the recipient. A uh, quick little touch on the company here. Uh, again, co-founded with Xiao Xi Wei here in the top left. Um, this is us in the molecular foundry where we started our work, you know, just initially one person and we grew to two and we grew to many more. And now we're about 20 people and have even started a subsidiary in Europe. And uh, the picture in the top right shows our our team in July, we've added a few since then. Um, and that's our first global summit. Um, and what we're really working on is how to transplant organs better using safer and more effective chemistry. Uh, everything is alive now, all these medicines are living. So they all suffer from the same thing. They all need to be preserved in order to go from the manufacturer to the patient. And it's most apparent in an organ transplant. And we learned from fish and nature about how to do this, how to survive cold temperature without being damaged. Um, first, I want to touch just a little bit about what is organ transplant and the organ waiting list. Um, we find, as we, we discuss with more people, uh, it's actually kind of surprising. A lot of people really do think that when you're sick and you need a new kidney or you need a new heart, you go to the hospital and maybe you're in there for a couple weeks and you come back out with a new kidney. Now, that's not how it works. 
Um, it's about eight years long wait list right now. That's the average wait time to get a kidney. So organ transplant is life-saving medical science that was developed in order to uh, give you a new organ that can help save your life if you have an organ that is failing. Um, there's surgery involved. A lot of different pieces and components are involved, including a support net network of donors, um, logistics companies, airplanes, helicopters, transplant centers, organ procurement organizations, and a whole bunch of people all combined just to make this life-saving opportunity happen. Right now, the transplant list is about 105,000 patients, but we know there's, there's many more who come on and off the list who get too sick and, and then they're healthy, go back, and many different issues there. Um, <clears throat> why are we really in this situation? Well, because we store organs on ice. We cool them down after we take them from the donor and then transport it to the patient. Well, it's just like putting something from your um, bench top into your refrigerator or your refrigerator into your freezer. It lasts much, much longer when it's colder and that's great. Um, <clears throat> right now, an organ transplant, uh, we do spend about a hundred billion per year, like billable cost, not just market economics, but actual billable cost to cover about 150,000 transplants per year. We estimate there's a 90% unmet need in the world. Uh, we know, again, it's much, much higher. There's metrics we can't even calculate here about who really could have an organ if more were available. And so really not using about 80% of organs that are donated um, because we don't have enough time. There's only four to 16 hours before you see significant damage to an organ uh, to get it from the donor to the recipient. For instance, the heart only has four hours and the best transplant centers in the U.S. cut it off at four hours and one minute. They won't transplant that heart after that. Um, and why are we here? Well, because we think if you preserve things better, they last longer. Like I mentioned, if you put them in a freezer. Um, and you can see this pink line here. We have a y-axis, which is the viability of the organ, or whatever it happens to be, cell apheresis pack. And the x-axis is length of time. How many days or hours can it be preserved? You see a heart has a very um, big cutoff range at four hours. Very few get extended beyond four hours. Only the healthiest of the healthy donated hearts can go beyond that. Now, every organ is different. But in reality, they could all be extended longer if we could cool them down further, below zero degrees C. But we have a problem, ice. Ice is our enemy here. It'll damage the organ, just like freezer burn. If you put a piece of meat in your freezer for a month, maybe it's okay. Three or six months, you might find that it's gray and it's damaged, its texture is different, there's ice all over it, it's harder to cook. That's all because of ice damage, shreds apart all the cells as the ice grows. And uh, how do we stop ice? Well, your car can stop ice. It has antifreeze or car coolant in it, um, but we can't use that for life, right? We can't use it for organs, otherwise we would be using it now. It's too toxic. So we need new cryoprotectants in order to solve this issue. And so, uh, long ago, when founding the company, Shashi asked, what if organs could be frozen without freezer burn? Uh, we need new molecules for that. And so we're extermatized into nature here is that animals have figured out this problem generally. Uh, so fish live in Arctic oceans that are uh, below zero degrees C. They're minus two degrees about. Well, that should form ice, right? Um, this water is salty, so the water is not frozen, but in the fish's body, it's not that salty. They have something very special called an antifreeze protein. It actually floats around in the bloodstream, and when it detects ice, it sticks to it, and it binds to the ice so that it doesn't grow any further. It's amazing. Uh, insects have this. Uh, there's different activity levels. It can be up to 100,000 times more effective than the cryoprotectants we have now. Again, the molecules that are in your car coolant, way more effective but it's really, really hard to use these antifreeze proteins in a human application. Um, so we thought about using biomimetic nanoscience. So that is using the chemist's intuition to look at what nature has. And we say, oh, there's this protein here and we can take a look at the active region and try to translate that. It doesn't translate exactly, of course. So you have to have a lot of chemical intuition. And we said, what if we put it on a backbone called a peptoid? So that's in the bottom right here. It's a new molecule, been around 30 years, a new class of molecules, but they function very appropriately for industrial use, what the human need is. Uh, and we could see how active it is because on the left side here, we have three different images of ice formation. So ice is dynamic and it grows. It's not just frozen and stuck there. It grows over time. 
So on the top is uh, ice water, actually. So just water that's frozen into large ice crystals. On the bottom is antifreeze protein in water. And we can see it has long spindle-like crystal formation. Uh, but sometimes it can't really control the, the, the growth at the tip. So the tips can grow and actually stab through cells. But our peptoid here in the middle on the right side a little bit there, we have much smaller ice, it's much rounder, the process is controlled much more appropriately, and we like to say it's nice ice. And what we've done is taken that peptoid and we made it into a, a liquid, an ex vivo preservation solution that is used for organ preservation. And we can use this all over uh, medicine, whether it's getting the materials themselves to produce new uh, cell therapies, or the actual cell therapy themselves, or perhaps vaccines, uh, everywhere. Our current focus uh, for this talk is on organs. So I also mention here we have a time seal organ transporter in the top left. So we perfuse the organ with the liquid, and then we submerge the organ in the liquid inside of time seal. And it just, uh, just like they do an organ transplant now without having to make a big change to the process. Fundamental improvement in chemistry. Uh, some of what we've achieved is we've actually brought in these frozen hearts back to life. Uh, in a mouse model, we're able to do dozens of hearts and store them for 24 hours. So that's four, uh, six times longer than the clinical standard of four hours for the human heart. Um, so if we take it out, we put the heart in a XTV vivo for 24 hours at sub-zero temperature, put it in a new mouse, it'll beat again for the entire rest of that mouse's lifespan. And that's all work we did with Johns Hopkins, some, some top surgeons there that we uh, collaborate with. This year, we announced that we were given the breakthrough device designation by the FDA. So that means now regulators are really behind us, that this is a true breakthrough. They believe and agree with our data that we have the potential to preserve or kidneys for up to 120 hours. That's enough to distribute organs globally. And what that breakthrough does is it gives us a huge advantage for moving through the FDA. They have to respond to questions at any time. Uh, they have 30 days to respond. We don't have to wait for any certain period. Um, we get nationwide pricing. We don't have to negotiate with every locality. And surgeons and hospitals get reimbursed immediately when they use our product in a surgery. Um, and when you think about it, what does it really mean to have more time for an organ transplant? Well, if you think about a, a country like New Zealand, uh, very good economy, very uh, good human development index, but a much worse transplant rate compared to the US. Of course, there's lower population, but the real issue here is that it's centrally isolated. It's way out of that 250 nautical mile radius for an organ transplant that is generally used. You can't get to Australia with that. But if we had more time, we could even get to South America and Europe with organs. Um, we have better outcomes because the quality of the organ is better at the time of transplant. We have more transplants. We enable global sharing. And of course, lower medical costs, because as people are not waiting around so long for the organ, they're not, they're not so sick anymore. They get a new organ when they need to. They get out of the hospital quicker. Everything translates to lower medical costs. And perhaps one day, we'll have global precision matching for organ transplant. So you can have one organ for life instead of a new organ every five to seven years. Um, so that's my talk for today. And I want to thank you for this invitation to talk at the Midday Science Cafe at LBL, uh, where I, I served as a postdoc at the Molecular Foundry for three years before heading out to, to work on this company, Xtherma. Um, the company has recently closed our Series A financing in December 2021. We're expanding and growing. Uh, we are in Richmond, which is just north of Berkeley. And um, you know, we've had excellent collaborators and support from uh, Berkeley Lab, Department of Defense, uh, National Science Foundation, CERM, and uh, of course our, our collaborators with Hopkins, Gladstone, and uh, ASTAR, and everybody else. So uh, thank you very much for the chance to talk today. And uh, ready for any questions. Mark, thanks so much. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you before we invite our next speaker to the screen. So um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about how this technology might impact the life of surgeons, for example? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, when you think about organ transplant and this type of product, you may not realize that the surgeon is the primary customer. Uh, because if they have more time, they may not have to ride in helicopters everywhere. You may not need the entire transplant team to go. 
you have the, the ability to schedule on commercial aircraft rather than private jets. Um, you can have Christmas again, birthday parties. You don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. consistently to do an organ transplant. A lot of organ transplants are done in the middle of the night. That's when the ORs are available and they have to be done now. Uh, so if you can extend that time window to multiple days, well then of course the surgeon can benefit by getting some of their own time back. It's actually one of the um, I'd say most hectic professions in medicine for sure, being an organ transplant surgeon. Got it, thanks. And you, you mentioned that um, it looks like you've got support from the FDA to look at kidneys for transplant. Does, does Exotherma have plans to preserve other organs besides kidneys? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so organ preservation solutions are in general broadly used. So uh, the current organ preservation solutions are used on all organs that are transplanted. We expect that to be the case with our technology as well. Uh, we just have to get out there and prove it. So we've selected the kidney first uh, for various reasons besides just market size. Also the physical size of the kidney is good to work with. And uh, we think it's a great entry because a lot of the organ waiting list is for kidney transplant uh, recipients waiting. Got it. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Um, we're going to turn things over to our next speaker, but for anybody who has questions for Mark, don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A or to the chat, and we'll get to them at our Q&A session at the end. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen. I'm going to invite Dee back up to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Jen and Mark. That was fabulous. So, if Phoebe can join me and Mark can pull his screen slides down. That would be wonderful. Excellent. So I have the pleasure of welcoming Phoebe Parks Shames. She is an interdisciplinary researcher combining landscape ecology, wildlife conservation, community ecology, and social science. Her work engages stakeholders in conservation solutions that intersect policy, management, and the environment. Currently, she is a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley with Dr. Justin Brashers and Dr. Chris Schell, where her work focuses on the ecological outcomes of cannabis legalization, which we will hear all about today. So we're super excited and I will let you have the floor, Phoebe. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Um... Well, I'm really excited to talk with you all today about the effects of cannabis farming on wildlife. And I'm going to start with just a quick um, list of the reasons why I think studying cannabis is so important. So first of all, cannabis is a huge industry. We're talking multi-billion dollar industry. It was recently ranked as the fifth largest crop in California um, and legalization is spreading across the United States. However, it's also massively understudied. So because cannabis for decades was grown illegally and is still illegal at the federal level, there's been a lot of barriers to understanding this crop. And we're missing a lot of the baseline data that most other agricultural industries have. So as a new legalized industry, policies are still being formed for cannabis production. And we also see that federal legalization may be on the horizon in the near future. So this is also a really important opportunity to apply research to the policy realm. And then again, because of this history of cannabis production, um, for, for the decades that it used to be grown illegally, it often was done so in areas that were out of the way, further from law enforcement. And that also happened to be in areas that had higher bio, biodiversity. So now with the increases in production with the legal industry, we've got a lot of concerns about that overlap and potential environmental impact. So you see this have come up a lot with um, the news articles that you hear about cannabis and people's concerns and communities, um, but there's also a, a lack of research in this realm as well. And then personally, I really think the issues around rural outdoor cannabis farming are similar to the conservation issues around rural livelihoods more broadly. So this includes a wide range of topics, including wildfire, human wildlife conflict, water use and drought, sustainable agriculture, and more. So now that I've given you a little bit of 
of a taste of cannabis research, um, I want to dive into what my work has involved. So in my research, and especially in my dissertation work, I took a multi-scale approach to understanding cannabis systems. And I specifically focused on small-scale outdoor cannabis on private lands. And some of my work is from Southern Oregon, but the dynamics are very similar in Northern California as well. So first I started at a landscape scale, trying to understand where cannabis was distributed and why, uh, as well as what that might mean for regional ecosystems. And then I zoomed in closer to look at wildlife dynamics happening on and surrounding cannabis farms themselves. And then finally, I narrowed down even farther to look at specific practices that might be occurring on farms and their potential impacts on wildlife. So my research as a whole goes from broad to narrow in scale. At this landscape scale, I combined interview and mapping data to study where and why cannabis was distributed. I found that there was a broad scale overlap with sensitive wildlife habitat. However, I needed to know whether that overlap actually resulted in impacts on wildlife on the ground. So I had to zoom in a little closer to the scale, scale of individual farms themselves. So for this research, I used wildlife cameras on and surrounding active cannabis farms and analyzed wildlife attraction and avoidance. And I have an example of some of the, some of the results from that work. So this is a graph on the x-axis. We have distance to cannabis farm. So at the zero would be on the farm itself and then it goes out to about a kilometer and a half. And on the Y axis, axis, we have occupancy probability. And in this case, you can think of that as sort of the likelihood of an animal using that space. So we find that some species like deer and tree squirrels have a higher occupancy further away from farms, ending, indicating that they may be avoiding these spaces, while some species like brown squirrels, foxes, and domestic dogs actually have, have a higher space use intensity on the cannabis farms themselves. So what we start to see is that there is this variation in wildlife response, um, which can be potentially concerning if you've got sort of a separation of food webs or sort of um, interactions between species. So from here, we have a broad landscape overview and then we have some understanding of on the ground impacts, but what we don't have yet is an ability to say anything about why we see some of these responses and especially these sort of differing responses of different species. So to understand what specifically might attract or, or deter an animal, we have to get even more focused to the level of specific farm practices. So at this stage, we can start to get at how and why wildlife might be affected by cannabis farming. But let me explain why that can be a challenge to tease apart with cannabis. So this is an example of a cannabis farm and there is a lot going on. So to, in the development of this farm, you might have clearing, there might, there's um, a big perimeter fence that goes around this farm. We've got a greenhouse on site that has occasional night lighting. They've also got a drying barn with a fan. And then there's also just more people on site than there was before this, this space was a cannabis farm. So there's a lot of different potential pathways that might impact wildlife. And then on top of that, there is a huge variation in practices occurring on cannabis farms. So not all farms will have the same impact. If we wanna actually understand specific practices on cannabis farms and how they might affect local wildlife, therefore, um, as, as well as ultimately trying to lead to how we might mitigate those impacts, um, we have to rely on some different approaches. So one way to do this is to simplify this picture. Take away some of this variation and just focus on one or two pathways. So in this case, we were looking at light and sound, using field experiments to mimic the light and noise that would be produced by cannabis farming, but in a controlled field experiment. And then we monitor wildlife around these disturbance sources at different distances. So I'm going to give an example of some of the equipment that we use. We have monitoring methods that include um, uh, met, uh, monitoring equipment for medium to large mammals and insects, birds, bats, 
and small mammals and reptiles. And this is a little bit of what that looks like. So we get photo data for rodents as well as for reptiles and then also for the medium to large mammals. And we can take these, identify the species within them, and then run our statistics on them. So the results are all still in process, but I do have some very preliminary findings to share. So the first is that we're finding that insects are attracted to the light at close thresholds. Large mammals are deterred from the light, but especially from sound, out to at least 50 meters. We're finding fewer species of bats detected on nights with lighter sound. Take that with a grain of salt though, because we still have to verify those calls. Um, and the same is true for the bird acoustic data. Um, and those results are, are very variable and we're gonna have to analyze them by species. The small mammal and reptile results are still in process, but overall we're expecting to see individual species or species groupings respond differently, which I'm hoping will help us understand where some of that variation in responses is coming from. So that's sort of the research overview, and I want to leave you with a few take-home thoughts. The first is that cannabis is a social ecological system, by which I mean that the ways in which it impacts the environment are heavily influenced by its history, legal status, and the culture around how it's farmed. In turn, the decisions we make about how to study this crop, such as the treatments we're using in these experiments, are guided by our understanding of regulations and questions that the farmers have about best growing practices. There's a lot of room for education and collaboration with farmers to help develop these best management practices. And I'm really hoping that we can take some of these results to the actual farmers themselves and help um, collaborate on recommendations based on this, these impact results. Cannabis is held to high environmental standards for good reason, but farmers also need support to meet requirements. So in doing this research, I think it's really important to remember that when we are developing requirements or recommendations, that we also need to develop the infrastructure to help support farmers to meet those. This is a crop that is still federally illegal and as such, many farmers can't afford, um, can't afford these measures because they can't do tax write-offs. They can't get small business loans. So some of that other infrastructure is really important to think about along with these environmental impacts. And then finally, light and noise disturbance research is applicable for a broad range of other settings. So it's important, this research is important for understanding anywhere we produce light and sound, because as we know, we live in a bright and noisy world. And this is a photo from NASA that really serves as a reminder for me that while this research is really relevant for cannabis, it's also informative of our impacts on ecosystems at a much broader scale. So with that, I wanna say a quick thank you to the Cannabis Research Center at Berkeley, to the PIs for this project, Justin Brasheres, Mary Power, and Peter Boisky, as well as my advisors, Justin and Chris Schell, our funders, particularly the, the Department of Cannabis Control, our field collection teams, especially Allison Smith, and our large team of undergraduate research assistants. Thank you so much, Phoebe. That was excellent. We have some great questions coming in from the audience. So one of the questions we'll start out with is, why did you um, do some of this research in Southern Oregon and not California where we are? So I actually grew up in Southern Oregon. And part of the reason why I wanted to study cannabis was because I saw the landscapes where I grew up changing really dramatically and really rapidly with legalization. And that was also where I learned that people weren't studying this. And I had an opportunity to engage the communities where I grew up on a topic that was really important and meaningful for them. And then beyond that too, a lot of my research took me on to actual cannabis farms themselves, which um, given the history and sort of the reticence of a lot of farmers to open up to legal systems and to researchers meant that um, I had the best success in getting access to farms in the places where I had social networks already to exist and to sort of build that list of potential collaborators. Excellent. So is that why another one of our questions has to do with what you just said about this being private land? So why did you use to why did you choose to use private land as opposed to public land? Mm -hmm. 
So part of it is an access piece. And then part of it is where the research gap was when I was starting this research. So a lot of the existing cannabis research before I started was all about public land trespass production and sort of the practices happening on those sites. So I felt like that that piece of the cannabis industry was already pretty well covered, whereas there had been, at the time I started, no research on the environment and private land production. And so that was part of why I wanted to focus on that. And then the other reason was that as we see this industry legalized, the part of the whole point is to move on to private land production and to move into a legal industry. And so it's really important for us to understand what's happening on those parcels because um, one of one of the anthropologists that I work with at the Cannabis Research Center, Michael Polson, always has a really great statement, which is that um, you can't regulate something that is illegal. So when we're talking about formulating policies and formulating best management practices, you kind of have to start with the legal farms and the farms that have the option to become legal um, because you actually can't say anything about best management practices for uh, a farm that will never be legal. That's a really good point. Well, I love that you were doing local research. You found the niche that needed you and you were passionate about, you know, making sure that any ecological concerns in your area were being addressed. So that's really neat. Um, we're going to take a, a moment. You can pull down your slides and ask Jen and Mark to rejoin us in this Zoom sphere. And we will go through some more of those questions. So I'll hand um, things over to Jen for some more questions. Sure. Thanks. And Phoebe, that was a fascinating presentation. Um, so a uh, couple of questions for Mark from our audience. Um, you know, it looks like Exlerma is at the beginning of some of this work, but um, what's your what's your hope for functional longevity of a transplantable heart or, you know, other organs? Are you looking at lungs? Are you looking at, tell us what, what Exlerma has in mind for the future, what the, the hopes and, and goals are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we're hoping that like in the mouse, 24 hour preservation will translate to the human heart as well. Uh, 24 hours is I mean, phenomenal compared to the four that we have. When we talk to surgeons, they just pray that we can even get to eight hours. Um, that is just enough for them to be so much better in all the operations that they have to do. So if we can translate that 24-hour mouse heart preservation to 24-hour human heart preservation, we're talking across the U.S., um, uh, people from Hawaii, Alaska, everywhere where there can be a transplant center, uh, we're actually able to, to, to get organs everywhere within the U.S. And we'll be able to do some cross-border stuff as well. Um, and again, touching back, it is our goal to make this broadly, XT vivo broadly usable for all organs to be preserved. Um, we're working through the, the research that needs to be done there for sure. Fascinating. So, you know, going from four hours to 24 hours sounds incredible. Uh, can you use cryopreservation to even lengthen that more? Like is, is 48 hours feasible or is 24 hours sort of where things are right now? Yeah, um, so when you talk hypothetically about freezing something, you would think that you can make it last longer. Um, that makes sense. It's just extremely hard to freeze things appropriately. Um, you know, so think about gelato, right? Um, the reason gelato can have a lot lower fat content, a lot lower sugar content, is because the freezing process is very, very fast. So the ice crystals in gelato are very small compared to the ice crystals and normal ice cream. Uh, same reason why when you have after party ice cream and you put it back in the freezer, it's horrible and you break your spoon, right? Everybody hates that. It's because of the freezing process. So as you scale up in organs and different sizes or different materials, everything freezes at a different rate. The inside freezes at a different than the interior versus different than the exterior. And you have to balance all that. Uh, so it's been the long-term goal for many, many groups to freeze organs or freeze everything as they can for as long as possible. Uh, but we're gonna definitely need some more research there. That's for sure. Got it, fascinating. And also good to know about ice cream and gelato. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of the things when you do this, this profession is you become more of an ice cream snob 
<laughs> don't buy it and you don't buy anything more than five minutes away from home because it's going to start thawing out and they put it in the freezer and it creates ice crystals ah yeah <laughs> it's one of the quality concerns <laughs> i love it so folks we're not giving you just interesting lectures we're giving you tips on how to store your ice cream i love i love it um phoebe let me uh head over to you for a question so the west coast in general and california in particular and you know we're having some pretty serious water issues and i you know i think cannabis is a pretty water intensive crop so do you have concerns about the ecological effect of uh, growing demand for water for this new intensively grown crop and is there still a considerable illegal grow production in California? All right, I will tackle the water questions first. Um, so the first piece is that again, with the research gap um, and also with the variation in production styles means that I think it's a pretty hard, it's pretty hard to make a blanket statement about whether or not cannabis is a water intensive crop. Um, for a long time, we were running on some, some estimates that were produced in 2015 for sort of water consumption, but we've realized over time that that estimate, which I think was like five ga gallons per plant per day, we've realized um, most, most farmers um, are probably not using that and certainly not for most of the growing season. And so um, there's been a lot of open questions about water use. And right now um, we have some researchers from the Cannabis Research Center who are applying for some grants to actually go in and do the much more intensive water monitoring and actually get like monitors in the ground on as many different farms as we can to try to actually answer like how much water is cannabis actually using? Because that, that baseline information is actually something we're still missing for that crop. Um, that being said, I think in general, Anytime we have an increase in water demand, that's going to be a concern, especially in areas that are suffering from drought. Um, I think one thing that's important to remember is sort of the comparison between cannabis and other crops. That's part of what we're excited to be able to do once we have some of that better baseline data is especially in some regions um, like Mendocino, where you may be Maybe you're, if you're a landowner, you're having a decision whether or not, you know, am I going to plant grapes or am I going to plant cannabis and trying to get some better information about like, not just cannabis on its own, but also in relation to alternative land uses. Um, what is the water use? Um, also learning from like, there are some dry farmers, dry farming cannabis farmers. Um, so learning like, how do you make that work? How is that possible? Like, what are the techniques and trying to help share, share that information to more farmers, I think will also help reduce the, the impact of water from this crop. Um, on a personal level, I'm really curious about the way we can use cannabis research and drought to answer some of these bigger questions about drought and climate change into the future and sort of say like, um, you know, which, which is the bigger impact, our use or just climate change overall? Like, does it even, I mean, this is sort of maybe a depressing way to think about it, but like, can we even change our practices enough to make a difference? Or is the long-term like future already set for us? Um, so those are some of the big questions I think about too. And then the, there was a, the second, what was the second part of that question? I think there. Uh, so the second part was, um, is there still a considerable illegal growing operation in California? So um, again, as you might be able to guess, um, studying the illegal production in California is pretty tricky um, because by nature of what they're doing, they don't necessarily want to be visible. Um, so depending on the, the research methods, it may not be fair, may not be fully consistent year to year, and we can't use things like enforcement numbers because the amount, the, the enforcement effort is not consistent year to year. Um, so that's actually a pretty, it's pretty tricky to study. Um, I will say, again, some of our researchers from the Cannabis Research Center have been a little bit more able to like dig into the market dynamics between um, legal and illegal cannabis. And they have a lot of concerns that some of the barriers to entering the legal structure and especially the, um, the price drop within the legal market is actually helping to enshrine the black market economy um, of cannabis. And, and I will also say, I think that there is sort of this, um, this hard limit where um, California may be the world's largest um, cannabis producer, but legally we're not allowed to export it. 
So as long as that's the case, um, you're going to have an illegal market because that's the only way you can move product out of state. Um, so I think there there is sort of that um, sort of uh, hard line for the market dynamics that that will always have an illegal industry as long as we don't have the cap capability of selling outside of the state. That's actually very fascinating. I hadn't thought about it in those terms or in that perspective, but very good point. And interestingly enough, there's a question about transferring organs across state borders. So we should just hop over to QMark, <laughs> organs, cannabis. Um, so are there major policy changes to cross-border organ transport? Yeah, so, um... You know, something that would be nice is when new technology brings questions about policy. And so currently we do actually do organ exchanges between Canada and the US. Um, not very many and just the kidney. Um, so if uh, a kidney is um, sent to many different transplant centers in the US and none of the centers accept the kidney, uh, then it will then be offered to Canada. And sometimes Canada will accept the kidney. Um, you know, they only have 30 million people in a country that's actually land mass much larger than the US. And so the, the disparity in geographic restriction is actually much harsher in Canada compared to the US. And so that works for them. But when we think about if thermos technology can be successful at the full vision and we're able to do global organ transplant, we will have to work with governments around the world to enable policies that allow us to do those transplantations. And that's even gonna reach back to organizations like UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, and organ procurement organizations in the US and getting some kind of crosstalk between nations, uh, even across oceans, about a system that has different people in it so that the organs can be matched, they can be uh, seen, firstly, so transplant centers can accept or deny them for their patient based on their patient's metrics. But we're gonna really have to consider all of those differences in um, policy. And uh, we're hoping to, to, that our technology reaches that level where major questions exist about how do we expand policy to allow for international organ transplantation to happen. Yeah, fascinating. It's gonna be very important, you're right. So let me move things back to Phoebe. There are, you know, you had just been talking about other crops. You had mentioned grapes and things um, like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are two questions. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Have um, the effects of farming on other crops been studied? I assume that that's true um, because you mentioned grapes and things and making a decision about um, what to plant when the farmer goes to plant. And then also, how is cannabis different from other agricultural crops? Yeah, so um, there certainly is a lot of research on other other, other agricultural crops. Um, just like with all research, there are there are existing gaps um, in our knowledge, and there's particularly a lot of research I think that maybe focuses on things like yields and more large scale industrial agriculture and. I think there's always more room, I suspect, for like the small scale practice farming and like diversified farming practices, intercropping, things like that. Um, as for cannabis and why it is different from other crops, I think that history really comes into play. So a lot of the places, what we call like legacy regions where cannabis was grown pre-legalization, tend to be areas that don't have a lot of other non-timber agriculture going on. And so I think partly the setting makes them really unique. Um, partly it's also the huge variation in growing practices. So without things like um, you know USDA um, research about best practices, without you know um, the like ANR UC ANR outreach about um, how to grow, there's not like set standards. So there is much wider variation in practices than we see with other crops. Um, that may be changing a little bit. We are starting to see like the rise of industrialized cannabis production in California. And that's a little bit more standardized, a little bit more similar to more traditional crops. Um, but even so, like, you know, there's very few other agricultural products that we have that is grown indoors even. Um, 
So there is this, this history of cannabis really informs the ways that it has been grown differently and in places that are really different. Yeah, very interesting research for sure. So here's a, a question that I pondered myself from the audience. Um, does the consumption of cannabis by animals impact their behaviors? No, not as far as we know. We believe that, so at least for people, for instance, you have to heat um, heat up cannabis in order to activate the compounds in it. So mm -hmm. there are even like some cultures because um, cannabis is native to parts of um, Asia and the Middle East. And there are places there where people eat like um, a cannabis leaf salad, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I, at least as far as I've heard, that does not have <laughs> psychoactive properties. Um, so the, the animals, as far as we can tell, when they consume cannabis, do not have any um, you know, psychoactive or altering um, properties. If they if somebody was burning a bunch of cannabis and there was animals nearby, maybe, um, but that's a fairly specific scenario. So I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Phoebe for that answer. Um, so I'm going to pivot back to Mark for a question we got from the audience. Somebody was curious to know why Exthem is using peptoids, but not peptides. Is there a structural advantage for, for peptoids over, over peptides? And maybe for folks in the audience, if you could give a quick refresher on the difference between the two, that might be helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so peptoids are very interesting. There's actually a body of literature to support their use as mimics of proteins or peptides. And so peptides make up your body. They are what compose proteins. The protein is a large version of a peptide. Peptide is a short one. And the difference between a peptoid, our molecules, and a peptide is just simply the units are moved over a little bit. So you can think about the backbone is just slightly moved. And that makes all the world a difference because now the body doesn't recognize the peptoid. It can't cleave it. Proteases, so uh, enzymes in your body that eat peptides, it doesn't damage the peptoid when it goes in to preserve the kidney. So that's one huge advantage if you use a peptide um, proteases will cleave it, it'll lose its function over time. And that's one big problem with peptide-based drugs right now. Um, peptoids are also extremely stable, especially compared to peptides. Peptides need to have very specific conditions. Peptoid does not. Uh, it can go very high temperatures, all kinds of different pH ranges, and it's much easier to commercially scale as well, much more cost-effective compared to a peptide. Uh, and it's very tunable. We can choose any kind of monomer, so like an amino acid, anything that's not natural, we can add it to a peptoid with chemistry. But you cannot do that with a peptide. Peptide, you're stuck with what nature has. Uh, so there's a lot of different advantages and why we chose a peptoid instead of a peptide. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so one more question for Mark. How, how else can cryopreservation be leveraged to, uh, to aid in human health? And, you know, I think maybe there, there are some, you know, sort of folks who in, the, in, in our audience who are curious, you know, could, could your technology have potential, for example, for cryogenically freezing humans? Yeah, so uh, I briefly touched on this topic. Uh, we call it regenerative medicine or medicines that are alive. And that's stem cell treatments, engineered tissues, um, uh, now vaccines, biologics, all kinds of different drugs, they're now becoming alive instead of just pills. And so freezing things better can translate to all of future medicine, essentially. And um, you know, we always like to be extremely optimistic as entrepreneurs, of course, and hope that one day our technology will lead us to another solar system. It's going to take quite a lot of more work, um, but hopefully we can someday. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, Phoebe, I'm going to turn things back to you. Can you talk about how the ecological impact um, changes when farms are, uh, you know, I guess transitioned from cannabis to another crop or maybe even vice versa? Yeah, so a lot of my research is thinking about in, in areas in which most of the transition that we're seeing is primarily from, from not from not really as much of their agriculture to cannabis. 
Um, but certainly I think that's one of the emerging areas, especially again, I think grapes are one of the big ones. And that's certainly like the concern of a lot of wine growing area, wine producing areas is, is the transition to cannabis. Um, but um, part of what I'm interested in is sort of um, the, um, the emergence of disturbance sources and the ways that interact with animals. So I'm specifically part of why I'm interested in cannabis is because of the dynamic of it, not necessarily replacing a high intensity human activity, but replacing something that was relatively low intensity. Um, and so that's, that's sort of part of my inspiration for why I'm studying this at all. Um, so I, I'm mostly less familiar actually with the dynamics of cannabis when it's replacing an existing uh, land use. But I would presume in those cases that if it is similar to what was there before, you'll probably see similar impacts on local wildlife. I think some of the things that tend to be a little different about cannabis um, from you know something like a vineyard might be, there tends to be a lot, of more, lot more fencing uh, going on. Um, so that's sort of like a structural barrier that you might see going up that might not have been there before. And then one of the sort of transitions from cannabis that we see um, is like, for instance, when busts happen um, of like illegal production on private lands, um, but also on public lands. But obviously for the for private land, the, the transition would presumably be to some other land use. Um, I think some of my big concerns there are that a lot of times the enforcement infrastructure and the funding for it isn't always paired with um, uh, remediation funding. And in fact, if it's on a private land, then it's usually supposed to be up to the private landowner to fund that, um, which can be massively expensive. So sometimes it just doesn't happen. Um, so that's something I have a big concern about um, also because a lot of times as part of the enforcement and process, you know, there's the, um, they want to ensure that people aren't just going to come back and start growing again, but it means that they'll like slash water tanks, they'll sort of destroy usable farming infrastructure, um, you know, slash piping and sort of put it on a big pile. And if there's like fertilizers or <laughs> pesticides, they don't necessarily have the equipment to remove it. So I have, I have some concerns about like um, what happens when we don't pair enforcement with remediation and the potential impacts on, on wildlife that way. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you, know, you mentioned um, vineyards and grapes. Uh, so I'll ask this next question, which is uh, deer can be pretty destructive natural pests for grapes in California vineyards. Um, do you know if deer are similarly attracted to grazing on cannabis? So it all depends on what's happening around the farm. So if there is um, enough natural forage, if it's a wet year and there's grasses everywhere, you know, those same compounds in cannabis that we really enjoy uh, probably in part developed as like anti-predation defenses. So it doesn't seem, it, it doesn't seem like it's naturally like an attractive plant for deer to eat, but if it's a drought year, if there's not enough forage, yeah, they will fully eat some of these plants. Um, and I've definitely talked to farmers who have lost, had significant losses from deer um, eating their plants. Got it. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, let me turn things back over to Mark. So um, one of our audience members notes that, you know, the altruistic prospect of, of transnational organ transplants really exciting, um, but there may be some concerns that it might enable unscrupulous third party entrepreneurs um, to maybe pressure uh, poor people into selling their organs in the developing world. I'm not sure if this is something Exler has thought about, but um, you know, how, how would you know, companies working in this space think about that issue or maybe even hope to limit that kind of behavior? Yes, um, you know, interestingly enough, um, we get that fairly reasonably often. Um, we actually had a whole discussion with this with the Rule Breaker Society in Germany. Uh, it's kind of one of their, their think tank societies. And at a dinner, it went from what is Xtherma doing to a uh, 20 person debate about how do we make sure that um, XT Vivo and Xtherma is being, is working ethically and is not uh, subject to these issues. Um, one of the arguments that I would like to bring up is thinking back to simple supply and demand and macroeconomics. 
Um, so the reason those current black market organ operations exist is because there is such a small supply of organs that are transplantable. So um, naturally we would hope that as the supply of organs is increased because we have more time, we even have a rotating bank of organs now that for a few days, that the need to seek out, uh, let's say, uh, maybe in a less ethical way to acquire a human organ would be less desirable. Uh, we would hope that would be the case. In the event that is still not the case, uh, of course, we would have to limit our sales to only uh, medical facilities, transplant centers that are have gone through our quality approval process. Our time seal transporters will have GPS tracking. We'll have to monitor them anyway and to make sure where the organs are. That's actually a huge benefit, again, for surgeons. Right now, their organs, they go on a plane and they don't know when they're going to land, where they go, or what luggage hold they're in. And you just see surgeons digging out luggage when it comes out of the airplane. It's not nice. Uh, so just GPS tracking with that respect will, will improve the, the surgeon's life, but also help us make sure that uh, the technology is being used appropriately. And because, um, you know, if you do have time seal, you can transport an organ. That's the same as if you have an angle cooler, you can transport an organ. But still, the real breakthrough is getting a hold of XD Vivo, which is the chemical solution, and the know-how and how to get all that working. Um, so we're going to have to pay attention to that and make sure it's always in our vision as we, we build the company. Um, but we do have some fail safes in there within the regulated environment uh, in the U.S. To, to help us make sure that our products are being used ethically. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have a question I think I'm going to pose to both of you before it gets too late in our uh, Midday Science Cafe. We often have students in the audience. For those who might be interested in pursuing career paths that are similar to either of yours, what would you recommend folks to study in or learn about or how do they get interested in your specific type of, of research? And why don't Phoebe, you go first. I think part of what's really great is that there are a lot of different paths that get you to where I'm at. Like in um, when I look at like the other postdocs who are also in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management, everybody kind of has their different life story and path that they they took to get to where they're going. Um, you know, some people, you know, majored in a biological science and then went on to get a master's and then a PhD, which is sort of like the traditional route. But like my advisor was an English major. Um, and so like, uh, there are a lot of different routes that take you here. I, th I would say the focus would be, um, regardless of what uh, your major is, get yourself some field, field experience, um, get out in the field, get some research experience, try to seek out those those internships or the course courses that get you those sort of skill set. Um, try to get a handle on some analysis skills. Um, that can be sort of through formal coursework. It can be um, through an internship, but it can also just be, um, you know, there's this program called R Statistical Software. It's an open source coding based analysis tool. And there are so many resources online to learn on your own for it. So it's it's been an exciting tool to sort of um, open the doors for people to be able to learn those skills without necessarily needing that formal background. Um, Thank you. And Mark? Yeah, so I guess I'll talk from two, dif two different perspectives because um, I'm both a scientist and uh, an entrepreneur, at least I like to call myself that. Um, so as a scientist, of course, doing what we're doing um, you need to have some insight into a problem that exists. So that's where Shashi had that from her background. I uh, always wanted to do organ preservation ever since she was a young girl having lost her grandfather early. Um, and so some inspiration combined with going to get a PhD is very, very useful in trying to get into this kind of chemistry or world changing thing to get a breakthrough device. Um, you need to have that inspiration from somewhere. And then for entrepreneurship, um, I am from rural Pennsylvania. I had no idea you could own a business. I had four jobs in one summer, and it never occurred to me that I could own one of those businesses. 
And so when I met Xiao Xi, she has a more entrepreneurial background. And that got me thinking, oh, maybe that's interesting. And so we did a little business together during graduate school and we, we enjoyed it and uh, continued together here in Berkeley. Uh, and uh, it really was, again, finding inspiration from someone else, getting out there, talking to people, seeing what exists in the world uh, so that you could say, well, maybe I can change something or maybe this is important or maybe I could own that or maybe I, I have a passion that I didn't know I have. So that's really what you need to do. Get out there, talk to people, learn everything, do internships, do an internship every summer. Uh, even if you have to push yourself and you say, oh, God, this is so hard. Why am I doing this? Keep trying it. You have to keep trying it. You need perseverance. Uh, so I guess that's my, my only tips I have. Just get out there and do it. Well, it's good tips. So thank you for sending those along. All right, back to Phoebe. So um, is the Center for Cannabis Research investigating the effects of siphoning off water from coastal streams for cannabis growth on native salmon populations? So it's a very specific, like not just siphoning water, right? We're talking about the drought, but also how that affects salmon populations. So I think we're doing sort of two separate pieces of that, but not necessarily them linked together. So we have the project that I mentioned earlier that we're trying to get a better handle on some of the baseline information about water use. Um, and some of that will also involve asking farmers about their water source and water storage as well. And then some of the components of my work um, at the landscape scale was looking at, you know, not exactly tying the link between, uh, tying the link to impacts on salmonids, but was looking at the proximity of production on a landscape scale to salmonid habitat. Um, and we, we did see that the, particularly for coho spawning habitat, that there is this proximity that is greater than you would expect by chance. So that does, that does give us some concerns um, and sort of, sort of raise the issue of, we wanna make sure that they are not, <laughs> If, if you are located close to those sensitive habitats that you're not siphoning the water out of the river. Um, but we haven't, I don't think we have a current project that is specifically on that topic. Lots of work to do. <laughs> so the last question um, for you that I see here are, um, I think that this is an interesting two, one too, because you're studying sort of all of the effects on these different animals. Well, what groups have been most affected by the cannabis farming, given all the restrictions like the fences and the um, things that you're, you're thinking about while you do this research? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the big questions we're trying to answer with these experiments. So far, my my gut is that the insects have been a pretty neglected group of species generally. Um, it's looking like they may be fairly sensitive to the impacts of cannabis farming. Um, you know, some of the the other species I think I mentioned earlier. Um, so herbivores, I think a lot of the deer and rabbits we're seeing signs. Really surprisingly to me, given particularly the research from the public land farming, which seemed to indicate that um, larger predators might be particularly threatened from cannabis in that arena, we have actually not been finding that they are particularly sensitive to the small scale private land farming, which was sort of one of my hypotheses going in, um, but actually we're, we're not finding evidence for that so far in the data. That's good to see, know that you're working with all different types of scientists, right? That team of people you had, like you had entomologists, you had bird folks, you had people who were thinking about the larger animals. So it's nice to see all of the folks at such a collaborative environment, definitely. And I'll hand things to Jen. Yeah, so a couple more questions that came in. One that I'm actually interested in learning a little bit more about. So one of our listeners asked, or said, you know, one of the concerns with using animal organs in lieu of human organs when they're not available uh, is the introduction of zoonotic viruses into the human population from transplanted animal tissue. Um, so 
Mark, are there any concerns that viral or prionic elements from animal antifreeze molecules might become incorporated into the products that Xtherma is developing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tackle that in kind of two different parts here. Um, first part, the peptoid is fully synthetic, so it doesn't use any animal components at all. That's another huge advantage of using a peptoid instead of a peptide. So we don't have any of those concerns at all. You use normal bioprocessing, aseptic fill and finish in a manufacturing process, just like you make um, all kinds of different media or things that are used in medicine now or saline solution that's injected into you in the hospital right now. We use those processes to make sure that those components don't get in. Uh, and the other point is, in terms of organ transplant, xenotransplant, yes, that is definitely a concern. So uh, actually we're finding out now if everyone remembers back to the news a few months ago where the first pig heart was transplanted into a human uh, in uh, Baltimore there. Uh, and unfortunately, he didn't make it after a few months. It was found that there was some, at the time, undetectable level of uh, pig virus or xenovirus in that heart that went into him. And unfortunately, he somehow was, um, it's kind of counterintuitive, he was non-compliant, which means he wasn't listening to the doctors. He wasn't taking the medicines he was supposed to be taking. And so, of course, the virus just went out of control, damaged the heart. And so he didn't make it, um, partly because there was some virus, but also partly because he didn't take his medicine and he refused to take it. I don't know why. He was willing to go into that experiment, but he wasn't willing to take the medication. So, yeah, that's going to be a concern. And uh, when you start to think about xeno uh, heart transplantation, all the... Um, uh, the companies that are making pig organs available to humans, it's going to be a primary concern for them. Uh, for us, we're just the, the supporters. We make sure that everybody can do what they want to do. Can you get an organ from X to Z? How do you get it there? Well, you use X to vivo to preserve it for longer. Thanks, Mark. That, that was really helpful um, to understand that better. Um, all right. I know we're getting close to, to 1.15, so we'll wrap up soon. Mark, we've got one more question for you. I think maybe somebody in our audience is getting ready for, for winter sports. They asked if Xtherma might be working with the ski industry to raise the freezing temperature to make artificial snow. <laughs> yeah. So we get all kinds of questions like this. Um, early on, you know, when you're starting the company and you're trying to find your traction, right? We always knew that we wanted to do medicine. But, of course, you meet investors who say, well, what about freezing ice cream? What about car coolant? Uh, what about actually coolant for jets? Because jets, military jets, use uh, jet fuel to cool their electronics right now, which is horribly inefficient. But they're flying at minus 60 degrees C. So what are they going to do? The antifreeze, you know, doesn't function so well there. And corporations have wanted us to spray strawberries so that they don't freeze and get freeze damage from, um, you know, uh, weather events. Um, but our focus is still medicine. And uh, that's really going to be our first entry until we reach larger production scales. And then we'll, we'll look at what industries make sense from there on. That makes sense. Sounds like there's lots of really exciting possible applications in the future. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to both Phoebe and to Mark for their fascinating presentations and for answering all the great questions from our audience. I think this is going to bring us to the end of our October session. Um, so thanks again for uh, all of the folks tuning in. We love the questions. Again, applause to our two presenters. Uh, as always, if you want to stay up to date on research coming out of UC Berkeley or Berkeley Lab, you can visit science at cal.berkeley.edu and lbl.gov. Thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our speakers and our always fascinating audience for the wonderful questions. Thanks.